Hey, hey, Stephen, have any idea for for little intro bits? Do you got a got a fun story to tell? Yeah, no, I've got a great one. Remember that one time you did a, like an airline intro and it was hilarious, and then you left us with nothing. Well, and then and then Craig decided to have an aneurysm and die and just completely I, ruin an entire planned recording session. I that hate time. It when Craig ruins everything by dying. Freaking Craig. He's like, well, it's if you're going to die, at, at least leave the microphone on, right? Yeah, at least die on your own time. Okay, all right, fine. I'll try for like two seconds. <clears throat> uh, hello, this is your captain speaking. On the right-hand side of the plane, just down on uh, the mountains below, you will see uh, the desiccated wreck of our moral discourse. And if you look to the right, you will see a uh, large ocean plane of chaos, which in fact is the emotivism that is the undercurrent for all of our modern speech, which contains no distinction between truth and falsehoods and only the will to power. Um, in a little bit, we will be landing in the metaphysical wasteland uh, that is our political structures in which there is no peace, but merely a temporary truce that will keep us from killing each other until it doesn't. Please fasten your seatbelts and the uh, attendants will be around with uh, free Coke uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. Thank you. The drink, ladies and gentlemen, the drink. The drink, yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The Problem with Reading. Uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And there's no Sam again. Rest in peace, Sam. Rest in peace, Sam. Moment of silence for Sam. Mm. Maybe he'll be back someday. Who knows? Um, but yeah. Right, right at, that, at that pause, you need to throw in like the, uh, the soundtrack Dun-dun. for... Oh. oh, well, that or the soundtrack oh. to like The Pacific or something like that. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's... Uh, have you heard of The Band of Brothers? It's a... Uh, I, uh, I I know World it's a, War II quasi do- no not documentary but like show. I know yeah I know it exists. Oh uh, man, you're missing out. I feel like this is a previous generation thing. I feel like this isn't my fault. I I, I was too busy with my um, propeller caps and and vapes and uh, electric scooters to watch your silly TV show. Yeah, about World War Two. You know, that's such, how how long ago was that? You know, like twenty years or something. Yeah, it was like at least twenty two. I don't yeah, really ancient. remember. Yeah, I, I I was a kid when 9/11 went when Hitler uh, hit the hit the two towers. That was the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Gosh darn Nazis. Gosh darn Nazis. Well, I, I've I've been thinking about the apocalypse, uh, Stephen. I we talked about this ad nauseum uh, mm. offline when Craig uh, failed and abandoned us. And I've been considering some some different visions of the apocalypse from various books and i know we've we've talked about canticle for Leibowitz and maybe some of walker percy's sort of extension of that and of course um after virtue was just the sort of moral version of canticle for Leibowitz in many ways the sort of vision of apocalypse that i've been most struck by recently is the bookend movies of princess mononoke and nasuka of the valley of the wind both films by miyazaki anime films although you know classics in in their own right that on the one hand in princess mononoke show show sort of the 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 end of maybe nature's upper hand and the emergence of technology and humans as the dominant forces and then nasuka of the valley of the wind which is the opposite post-apocalyptic in the narrow sense where earth has been destroyed and it's you know run by giant insects and a and a poisonous forest i don't know i left you no entry point in uh steven you've been reading anything interesting lately thinking about anything Qu- coincidentally enough canticle for Leibowitz. i'm uh, about halfway through the third part and uh yeah each chapter is incredibly ha- or each, not each chapter i get well i guess each chapter but each part is i would say equally haunting um mm-hmm. the the kind of humanity rising out of the ruins only to go right back into it and it's uh it's a so it's a very sobering book a very haunting book the uh the lady who helped me find it at uh, half price books she had read it before and and she started started saying like oh this is such a beautiful book and kind of paused and said no it's not beautiful it's haunting and i mm. i think that's a very apt description of it yeah yeah that's true the the cyclical nature of it which you don't truly complete until you get to the end of the third section i think undoes in many ways any i don't know teleology isn't exactly the right word but like the short term purposes of the various characters like with the the monk's goal being to preserve knowledge but it's really just going to all go away again humans are all going to kill each other again and 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 the the earthly 
the earthly goals that people have just keep getting wrecked and destroyed, not through any malicious action, but just sort of the inevitability of war, the inevitability of politics, the inevitability of random chance in the case of Brother Francis, which makes the, for me at least, the stubborn attachment at particular issues, um, such as the protection of um, the Pope's children in part one, all the more relevant. And yeah, there are just several points where seemingly like pre, pre-rational, extremely stubborn commitments to things show up because the cyclical nature washes out everything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're right. There's a, there's a great scene where the, the thom, thom, thon? Whatever, uh, the thon, uh, the the kind of professor figure, is talking to one of the monks, and he's he's about to leave, and he's kind of lamenting. This monk he realizes is an absolute genius that he is able to take like little bits and pieces of theory and actually create stuff out of it. He's the he's the first person probably on Earth uh, in the the post deluge to be able to create a working light bulb. Um, and the, the thought is like, no, you have to, you know, you have to come like, well, I'll pay you. I'll, I'll provide funding for your, for your monastery. Like you need to, to come with me to, to kind of continue inventing and doing all this. And in the thon's mind, this is like, this is the most noble, best thing. He is doing this monk an incredible honor and favor. And he's not being malicious. Like this is what he genuinely thinks. And the monk just kind of says, well, I'll, I'll do that if I have to. Um, if I receive my orders and the thought is really surprised. He's like, well, I mean, you don't personally want to. And the, the monk's like, no, I dedicated myself to this, like, th- like, or to, to this kind of pointing around to the, the monastery, like to Catholicism, to my religion. That, that's why I'm here. This like this invention, this, this studying and whatnot, this is incidental. I am here for, for Christianity. And I think that that's a, a very important part that, especially given the cyclical nature, you know, the, these transcendental values, this, that, those are what lasts. Technology, that will not. The transcendental, that will last. Yeah, and, and I, I don't remember who said it, but it's, there's something about you know, finding something bigger than yourself to commit yourself to um, that's just really, really important. Finding something outside yourself. Man, um, who does that sound like? To, it sounds to commit yourself to like, like you know, just a a big thing like 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 the ocean or or water or yeah. John McCain. I don't know, you know, just something like that. Um, oh man, it's right at the tip of my tongue, but right I just the can't for the life of me think can't, about that. Can't yeah. remember it. Anyway, uh, uh, hey Stephen, what are you drinking right now? Oh, sorry, I was thinking about some amazing philosopher whose name for some reason escapes me. Uh, yeah, right now, I what? Sorry. Oh, weird, weird, yeah. I don't yeah, I know, in a strange way. Right? Uh, right now, I am uh, finishing off some ice water, this time the, the pun version of the ice water. Okay. I love uh, this stuff. It's great. Peach nectarine. Like, who who would have thought this? I'm, it has zero sugar. I'm sure it's going to rot my insides nonetheless, but zero sugar, guys. I don't know if you saw that study, but drinking any sweetened thing on, on any kind of regular basis is guaranteed to give you cancer um, in five years. I don't, I don't I'll know. die happy. Yeah. Um, as for myself, I'm drinking the non-pun version of ice water, sans ice. Uh, so it's, it's it's water, my dude. Uh, it's a it's a lovely Wednesday here with the Boston Tap Water. Woot woot. There was a great moment where a couple friends and I, uh, they they flew up to Seattle and they were staying a couple days with me, and we went to this like random Denny's uh, to to get a late night breakfast. And this th- this server was the coolest server I've ever had, and he referred to our waters as uh, liquid ice. So he got us water, like whenever he would get us refills or whatever, he'd be like, more liquid ice coming up. And uh, I, I don't know, that has always stuck with me. I, I feel like that's disingenuous unless you can confirm that that matter was at one point ice, which by no means you can do. I'm pretty sure at some point in time in the last four billion, no, not four billion, 15 billion years of universe history that that water was at one time. All of the water, every, every molecule of the water was at some point ice. That's difficult, but I'm I'm going to go with yeah. I'm going to I'm going to claim that assertion. Okay. Well, you're you're a more trusting individual than I am. I I would want to see it to believe it um, personally. Mm. Um, but uh, but uh, speaking of seeing to of seeing to believe uh, something, um, some people some people have gone to the movies to see the drivel that our culture machine pumps out, and by that logic, they've also seen hell. 
Uh, one person who hasn't seen Hell is uh, David Bentley Hart. Um, and Stephen, I think you have something about that. David Bentley Hart. That also sounds like that one philosopher. That man. So, David... so if 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 this were a medieval village, uh, there wouldn't be any bandits attacking because uh, nothing is ringing a bell. <laughs> that was that that was that was something. Thank you. Okay. So, speaking of bad puns, hell, everyone. Uh, so. Uh, David, David Bentley Hart is uh, kind of the, the most recent uh, iteration of a uh, minority group in Christianity, the Universalists. So the ones that uh, do not believe in, at the very least, an eternal hell. Uh, and they believe that eventually, uh, as the Lady Julian said, all shall be well. And Douglas Farrow, professor of theology and Christian thought at McGill University and author of uh, Theological Negotiations, uh, he, he strongly disagrees with this. Uh, he is not happy, not happy at all. And uh, so David Bentley Hart has recently come out with a book, uh, quote, that all shall be saved, heaven, hell, and universal salvation, end quote. Uh, that wasn't a quote, that was just a book title, but you know. Arguing uh, for that, just that, universalism, uh, the belief that, as uh, the Lady Julian once said, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Uh, Hart argues that any vision of salvation that leaves at least one individual soul in the perpetual torments of hell is one that is inherently unchristian, vicious, and borderline diabolic. Uh, Hart launches first from a philosophical criticism of the concept of a rational agent resisting the eternal and infinite love of God for all eternity. Not only is it existentially troubling for an infinitely good God creating a reality that contains within it everlasting torture, it is also somewhat logically troubling for a finite rational agent to be able to resist the infinite call of the good. Uh, Hart, himself being no lightweight when it comes to biblical scholarship, has an entire translation uh, that he himself wrote at his disposal, and he is certainly not afraid to use it. He claims that most of the New Testament references to eternal damnation are metaphors, contrasting these with passages that present the desire of God for all to be saved. This is by far his most difficult task. Oh, I should note that I am uh, briefly outlining the article of Douglas Farrow, kind of him going over uh, Hart's major points, and then we'll launch into his critique. Um, after him dealing with some of the biblical scholarship, uh, he tackles the morality behind eternal damnation. Uh, there is certainly something troubling about the concepts uh, or the concept of the torments of the damned adding to the joys of the blessed. And Hart shows no mercy nor patience with those who would argue otherwise, which are certainly some theological heavyweights, uh, such as Augustine, for example. Augustine and Aquinas, I think, both argued uh, for that. Uh, the article cites Hart in saying, quote, we cannot cease to cease to care for any soul without in principle ceasing to care for every soul. For souls exist only in webs of mutual at attachment. How can every tear be wiped away without all being saved? Uh, end quote. A person is first and foremost a limitless capacity, a place where all shows itself to be special inflection. We belong, in fact, to a to an indissoluble coherent sorry to an indissoluble coherence of souls. So either all persons much must be saved or none can be. He concludes that God is the moral equivalent of a massive gravitational well, a quote transcendental horizon of the will end quote, that overshadows any other gravitational center that could be conceived. Eventually, all things will be drawn to God and the good. One cannot stay out of that horizon forever. Even going so far as to cite the incarnation as evidence that, quote, under the sun, S-U-N, the incarnation demonstrates that it is no part of human nature to reject God fully. The incarnation confirms the fact that evil has no power to hold us and we have no power to cling to evil, end quote. Uh, Pharaoh attacks Hart on a multitude of levels. While Begur begrudgingly admitting that Hart does a decent job at least making it difficult to critique him, he quickly goes on to point out that Hart has an embarrassing amount of ad hominems and rhetorical flares that don't necessarily have much substance behind them. He strongly critiques Hart's exegesis as eisegesis and argues that Hart misunderstands the very tradition of hell and freedom. Quote, tradition does not pose it, even if some proponents of tradition pose it, that hell exists because there must be some real art alternative to God open to the creature. That is to misunderstand the nature of our freedom. As Anselm explains, freedom operates in the space between the will to happiness and the will to justice, both of which are given to us precisely to lead us to God. What Hart describes as freedom, uh, which he quotes Hart, freedom consists in the soul's journey through this interior world of constantly shifting conditions and perspectives towards the only home that can ultimately liberate the wanderer from the exile of sin and illusion. And, Hart, and Hart's quote is not a sound alternative. 
with this formulation, Hart builds into freedom the very thing he rightly set, it rightly says, sorry, the very thing he rightly set does not belong to it. Negotiation between sin and righteousness, God and the devil, end quote. Up next is Hart's Christology, in which Faro accuses Hart of implicating Christ in every man's sin. Qu quote, Christology naturally gets caught up in this false negotiation. Adam represents sin in the devil, that is, the predominance of the devil within, with the only devil in which Hart seems to believe, which I'll go on aside and say that that's not necessarily the case with Hart, but that's besides the point. Uh, Jesus represents God in righteousness. The latter triumphs over the former, once and for all, bringing all of humanity to God. For the first man, Adam, and the second man, Jesus, are but two poles and one in the same man who in the course of his corporate journey at first rejects and later accepts his proper destiny. This way of thinking, which goes back to Gregory, implicates Jesus in every man's sin, just as it imbricates every man into his salvation, such is the price of universalism, end quote. Lastly, Pharaoh looks to land the final blow by accusing Hart of fundamentally mis misunderstanding God himself, introducing a false polarity into the divine by making the divine responsible for evil. This one is a longer quote, but it is worth reading. Quote, Finally, it must not be overlooked that Hart introduces a false polarity into God himself by making him responsible for evil. Creatio ex nihilo is a liberation from nothingness, which is already a kind of evil. In that liberation we have being, but brute or ignorant being, and ignorant being leads to sin, for which we are culpable but not fully, but never fully culpable. Out of sin we shall be trained, through the, though the training requires more time for one, for one man than for another. Some, as it happens, will need a long spell on the purgative, uh, purgative side of the divine fire. Uh, but that is not damnation, just a damn good roasting. All of this belongs to God's ongoing creative, redemptive act, to the fulfillment of his original being, to the realization of his primordial, ideal human being. For created time, in whole and in part, is nothing but the gradual unfolding of God's eternal and immutable design. For hell, that evil remainder, is eradicated only by bringing it inside the primordial ideal. Are we to be horrified by the notion that God consigns anyone finally to hell, even the father of lies, if there really is a father of lies, yet not horrified by the notion that all human suffering and sin, up to and including what we call hell, belongs to the very act of creation? Are we to deny perpetuity to hell without denying perpetuity to creation itself? What then? How shall we char answer the charge laid against origin from the start, that it must forever go round in circles, that, it ha that he has no means... Is that he has by no means escaped the cyclical worldview of the pagans on which true happiness is rendered impossible, end quote. Pharaoh observes that Hart has self-destructed with this final mistake and concludes, Hart makes clear in conclusion that if Christianity requires belief in eternal punishment, then Christianity is false, which prompts from, th from this reporter an unhappy observation. If he really believes that, then the new atheist to whom he gave a thorough thrashing in earlier books should demand a rematch. This time they might well win and by default, end quote. I confess I have not read Hart's new book, uh, though in my defense, it's still not out on mass release. Uh, I, oddly enough, he didn't send me one. Uh, however, I have listened to a few of his lectures and I get the impression that Pharaoh is fundamentally misunderstanding a few of Hart's points. The biblical arguments all see gr seed ground. Alas, it does seem that the Bible does lean towards there being some sort of hell and that there are those who do not leave. Um, though I... I'm not a biblical scholar. Hart seems convinced one way. Pharaoh seems convinced another. So I just have to say, I don't know enough to render opinion one way or another. Uh, however, his understanding of Hart's Christology is what's really suspect. Uh, Hart's a Platonist. Humanity attaining to Christ fits in nicely with the Platonic ideal. One becomes more real as one become, becomes more like Christ. Christ is everything humanity should be. He is the new Adam. How does this implicate Christ in every human sin? I'll repeat Pharaoh's accusation. Quote, for the first man, Adam, and the second man, Jesus, are but two poles and one in the same man, who in the course of his corporate journey at first rejects and later accepts his proper destiny. This way of thinking, which goes back to Gregory, implicates Jesus in every man's sin, just as it imbricates every man into his salvation, such as the price of universalism, end quote. So if Pharaoh is to be believed, because Christ comes representing God and righteousness and triumphing over the man Adam, he is now implicated in Adam's crimes. Has Pharaoh forgotten the theological implication of Christ assuming humanity. How does this matter one iota to universalism? This, is, this argument, if taken seriously, affects every branch of Christianity. All of a sudden, the incarnation contaminates the divine. Uh, his accusation of heart positing God as being caught in the crime of creating evil, of baking hell and sin and death into the scheme of the universe is just quite frankly wrong. 
uh, any sort of hell would be ontologically less real than heaven. So God creating the universe in such a way that this aspect exists is less of a problem for Hart than it is for Pharaoh. Pharaoh states that universalism necessitates that hell is was part of the very act of creation, but it's difficult again to see how this applies only to universalism. What, was hell added by God when the devil fell? He needed a place to stuff him and all the sinners? And even if that is the case, how is that supposed to make us feel any better? Recall Hart's Platonism. Hell would be a less real aspect of the universe, a falling away from reality and slinking into some shadow land. Any sort of escape from hell would not be so much leaving a gated community as an entrance to reality. It would be a soul accepting the reality of God and his goodness. Though I recall well MacDonald's warning to Lewis to not make the claim that heaven and hell are mere states of mind. Uh, Pharaoh makes the claim that if God were to eventually draw all creation back to himself, that this makes him responsible for those free-willed beings rejecting him, but that's just nonsense, or at least it makes as much sense as any other, or under any other eschatologies. So, on the whole, I sympathize with Pharaoh on two points. One, Hart does way too many ad hominems, and so I understand Pharaoh's rather combative tone. And two, I cannot help but wonder at the trajectory of free-willed beings that some seem, if you'll pardon my pun, hell-bent on resisting and fighting the divine. And that, experience, and that experience shows us that free-willed beings, ironically enough, rarely change. However, I still on the whole sympathize more with Hart that infinite good cannot be defeated by finite depravity. I'll confess ultimate, uh, and by ultimate I mean in the end, ignorance on the Christology question. Uh, uh, my thoughts. Uh, if the article is right, um, DBH's goal is to prove that no one suffers eternal damnation, which is, you know, sort of quite a project. Um, and I thought the article was a pretty fair summary of the argument. Like, I was brought along by it. Like, DBH at no point seemed wholly irrational or, like, dumb. Like, I, I think Pharaoh did a good job of summarizing DBH on his own terms, as far as I can tell, in as far as I was actually convinced, persuaded by DBH's argument. The warning signs was obviously on the scripture where um, he relies on his own personal interpretation of it, which is, you know, not not necessarily a bad thing. And by own interpretation, I mean, he literally interpreted the, the New Testament, but also just sort of the the shifting metaphors and very careful interpretation. Uh, Pharaoh seemed to show some pretty clear instances of where DBH is weak, which is only a problem because DBH tries to make scripture a positive argument for himself and so once he loses that that's a serious hole because most of his other argument at least a good portion of it is um a priori um along that note you know, hell as a as a purgative concept so s something closer to temporary cleansing um or at least the possibility of temporary cleansing is, is something that i i think is pretty reasonable um after a bit and you know uh something you know, insert obligatory god's mercy is infinite and unknowable um and after all that the church the the catholic church confirms tickets to heaven and not to hell um uh uh how uh pharaoh has a has a good quote though a uh, quote Hart, for example, takes every opportunity to display his outrage at the insufferable suffering of hell, hell construed as one tormented moment after another at infinitum, but nothing requires us to, underst to understand hell in that way, as if the time of hell was merely an extension of ordinary secular time, end quote. Uh, so if Pharaoh is right, and that is how Harrow describes it, which neither of us have read the books, so we don't know, but if he does, then he's strawmanning, you know, the many more nuanced and serious arguments of hell um, that affirm human agency and choice. Um, and he, you know, he falls into the same category as hell truthers like Rob Bell. The argument about where I, th I think we all agree about DBH being inflammatory and, you know, spewing an invective applies at that point and at others that have been quoted to, to, to sum up. I think I ended a little bit more critical of DBH, but I, I, I definitely have a, uh, suspicion of the of those who are universalists uh, generally because it arises out of other projects. Many universalist types, in my experience, are truly the other pole from the people who you know want to condemn people to hell all the time very confidently. It's as in in many cases, it's as if you know they saw a thesis and they just have to go like, oh. Damn, we need the exact opposite worst worst thing of that. And not saying DBH is that, but Pharaoh does give some indicators uh, of DBH heading in that direction. So for that reason, I 
I end suspicious and I'll leave my um, stuff about free will and whatever for um, offline because that just gets so hairy so fast. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. It, I, so I really like uh, Dip and Lahar. I think he, I think he brings a lot of really, a lot of kind of refreshingly intelligent dialogue to the, uh, to the overall theological uh, community, uh, intelligent dialogue, and also a lot easier to digest. I mean, the man's pretentious as all get out. Like he, he enjoys slinging around big words and Latin phrases, et cetera, et cetera. But still for all of that, he is at least interesting to listen to. Unlike lamentably quite a few theologians and philosophers out there who are just dry as all get out. Like, I mean, even McIntyre's After Virtue, while I enjoyed reading it to an extent, there were times where it was just unbelievably dull. We enjoyed where... being done with it. Is, is, yeah. is, is how that <laughs> well, well said. It, except, uh, the, the problem with him being entertaining to listen to is that I think it's ultimately somewhat leading to his downfall in that he's finding himself becoming more and more inflammatory as time goes on. And I do hope that he veers clear of the temptation to kind of come up with edgier and edgier topics uh this seems to be his edgiest yet though to be fair i was refreshed by his commitment to uh, well i guess for him uppercase o orthodoxy but primarily i was impressed by his commitment to lowercase o orthodoxy in that he does not want to depart with you know to make any radical departures from christian tradition or from scripture or what have you and yes while his own uh uh, translation of the Bi- of the Bible seems suspect. I think he came up with it, uh, or he translated it a while ago before he started this project. And so I'm at least inclined to say that there's a fair amount of um, objective uh, anal- or objective um, translation. He wasn't doing it with, you know, uh, what's the phrase for it? A sword to grind, not sword to grind, an axe to grind. Axe to um, grind. Yep. No. Uh, on 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 that point, just briefly. Um, I probably phrased it poorly. That is, uh, that's not what I um, uh, in- intended to suggest. My my notes are um, ambiguously phrased. Uh, oh, what, no, what, okay, I, what, what I what I meant to say was um, Pharaoh's demonstration of of how, or just of a few key passages where he in- interprets like a you that is understood by virtually everyone else. And I don't know what his own in- interpretation says, or like like what his scholarly work interpreting the bible says but he you know he in, interpreted this as like a metaphor you but everyone else was like no like this was what was addressed to people and there was just a a couple instances of of that where he was interpreting scripture and i mean that in he was doing exegesis and not literally translating in a very unusual way in order to make his point work that is what i meant <laughs> yeah. yeah oh that that's entirely fair that's entirely fair i I'm not sure if he goes into it in the book at all. I'm I'm actually uh, somewhat considering after I, I've I've already uh, got um oh shoot uh, the experience of God that's his that's his kind of magnus opum from what I understand um, I'm gonna read that and then I'm I may end up reading this one because it does seem like a very interesting book but I'm wondering if he goes into um I think I sent you a YouTube video uh, on on his kind of one of his shorter papers on universalism where he argues uh, at it from uh, Creatio ex nihilo. Um, in, in in essence, he he says something to the effect of um, the, that if God creates from nothing, uh, then his final judgment on all of creation uh, will show him for who he is. Like his judgment will almost be on himself. Uh, although Hart does back away pretty quickly after saying that, um, because he he does understand that there is a certain amount of hubris in that, which I was grateful for him at least acknowledging that there is. Um, but there is something. <sighs> He he has another quote. If God creates souls that he knows are destined for eternal separation, or even thinks are destined for eternal separation, there's even a chance. Uh, like what predicate can be assigned to him? Um, like he he has ultimately decided that that it is good for failure to happen. Um, it is good for suffering to happen. Now, I think you bring up a good point in saying like, well, that's just assuming, you know, kind of eternal conscious torment, which is, I would argue, and I think you would as well, a bit of a straw man when it comes to different, more nuanced uh, visions of hell. So he, he, he has a lot of really interesting stuff. And I, I, I hope that Pharaoh didn't straw man him too much. Although I'm, I'm kind of with you in that. It seemed that Pharaoh was doing a pretty honest job at assessing what the book was going for. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> uh, speaking of, of seeing what uh, uh, something is going for, uh, let's talk about the mimetic bottleneck, uh, which is my article for this week from a uh, little blog called The Philosopher's Meme. And, and, and I'll freely admit, this is a little bit self-indulgent. Uh, I've been interested. Your memes. Me and my memes. Um, yes. I've been interested in finding sort of, or maybe moving towards, as we would say in academia, the proper philosophic language to apply to memes for a long time. Um, that is, you know, sort of make of memes what literature folks make of literature, uh, which they do, you know, rightfully so, novels, poems, stories. Um, but memes are have in some ways become comparable on on some level. Um, even if you have to say, okay, or like like the comparison, say, between a meme and a very short poem, for example, the the uh, virtually indistinguishable in in terms of literary content and ability to analyze. And in fact, the meme probably overtakes uh, any short poem any day um, in almost every r respect. And I've seen some attempts at this, but they're usually very dated and illiterate in the internet sense. And they do say that philosophy lags, you know, some distance behind the zeitgeist. And this is probably going to be one of those instances, especially because memes are so driven by technology and the internet. However, some people on the internet uh, do have a lot more free time and creativity than I do. That's what this article is. And the article starts with a case study of a base meme, uh, and then, which I'm not going to try and describe because that's, I like tried to write this out like hey how how should we describe this um but i'm not going to because that's a terrible idea but you can cl click the link and, and, and see for yourself um and i'll just get into the theory of it so it starts with a case study of a base meme and then several expansions and iterations off the meme with different contexts and references that the base picture is inserted into and then modified and uh it, it notes that most of these images and many memes are you know basically instances of the two panel comic. Some are, you know, if you see a, a single panel that's, you know, more a picture and just some very simple text, you're probably generally going to classify that as a meme, but especially as there become more and more iterations and, and expansions of a meme, as it gets more variations. In a lot of those instances, it becomes something like a two-panel comic. And that's not coincidental, because we think that comics are the closest thing we have to memes that aren't memes. And there's, you know, many instances of comics being turned into memes. They're, they're virtually in distinguishable except for you know a a comic has the intent and or, and original text and anything with a modified text has then become a meme so th they're very close and the article talks about a comic artist named will eisner quote defines comics as a subgroup of sequential art images ordered in a particular way to convey a narrative images in a sequence express the flow of time because they necessarily facilitate the synchronous flow of time for the reader Time flows while the reader moves from one panel to the next. While panels can't straightforwardly be considered units of narratological time without problems, they are useful to think of as some segment of time, end quote. And then the article goes on to complicate this, because we have several forms of sequential art in comics, um, sp still speaking in comics, uh, such as moment to moment. So you can think of a comic of, you know, a series of, of images that's clearly showing, you know, action in motion, like, you know, one step, then another step, or zooming in on an object. Or you may see action to action where you have, you know, like a bang or, you know, from a still to from a still image to an image of someone in motion. Or you can have a subject to subject, like a close up of a face to a close up of a face, an aspect to an aspect, like picture of the sun, picture of a guy walking, picture of a flower. And that gives you a scene, for example, uh, non sequitur, uh, which is just, you know, you can have lots of random images and that's probably something closer to absurdity, um, or absurdism, rather. So these aren't precisely segments of time that are being conveyed. And one panel is in context of the preceding and following panels, but there's not necessarily a, a linear movement in time in between them. And the most extreme example of this is uh, a guy named Scott McLeod's idea of the infinite canvas, which is a comic without pages, uh, but panels that extend in every direction. So it's like a giant... Like, imagine a canvas the size of the front of a house with a bazillion tiny little panels in them that are all connected by different lines and extend in all different directions and all different chronologies and all different aspects of a story that are all connected. So it's just all these ideas, these segmented units of compression that go in every direction. Um, and 
digitally, you could even make it a 3D space with a Z axis on a digital canvas. And the important thing here is that there are infinite directions or hypothetically infinite directions that the story and the panels can go into. And there is no linear, straightforward linear interpretation of the whole set as a, as a, as a canvas. It's uh, numerous small stories and then different branches that you can take. So then the article flips this to apply to memes. Um, when they are presented as single panels or posts, you know, they're discrete and they're unitary. Um, but there's always a, a pretense of a contextual panels, not sequential ones. There's something before and there's something after, which is the evolution of the meme and, and as the meme changes. So all of these ideas just sort of pose a problem because it's, it's very difficult to define memes based solely on their meaning or on their history, which are, you know, constantly in flux and may or may not directly reference other things. So this article argues that the best way to understand memes is as objects with embodied rules, like a game. Thus, quote, memes characterized as above are a form of what we call nonlinear sequential art, end quote. Some people, narratologists, make the argument that nonlinearity is actually impossible uh, because humans can only experience things linearly. And here I, I must insert a obligatory Kurt Vonnegut reference. Um, uh, this is made uh, by appealing to the argument that, you know, humans can only look at things sequentially. There's unavoidable linearity as you look at objects. And, and people, you know, sometimes give this in video games, which video games in many uh, scenarios have branching storylines where you can, you know, go down this branch or you can go down this branch depending on the choices you make. You know, the world gets all evil or it gets good depending on your karma level or whatever. And they say, well, despite this appearance of non-linearity, it's actually linear. It's unavoidable. But the mistake that this makes is that it ignores the ability of humans to reload save files. Uh, and, this, and this is something that I've done uh, quite a bit, especially with uh, you know, RPG games where you make a choice and then you know, all the characters die. And it's like, oh, damn it, I, I didn't want to do that. So you go and you, re and, and you reload your save state and choose a new direction to go in. And this is a ability unique to humans as they are outside the story, but control the story and the branches of the story nonetheless. And memes are essentially load states of branching storylines. Quote, the player's choice of save files is about what can or can't happen next in the game as the consequence. Inherent in this choice is the choice of what has happened in the game up to the save point. The choice of which save file to load is the choice of what has happened in the past for the purpose of making certain choices possible in the future. This is analogous to the choice between various interpretive contexts for a given instance of a meme. The audience chooses among many potential contexts and interprets the image they are currently viewing. The image constrains the potential pasts and the possible futures of the meme, bottlenecking its narrative branches. Like a panel in a highly networked version of the infinite canvas, every meme is both a potential bottleneck and a possible choice. Since the sense that every meme has a preceding meme is essential to the appreciation of memes, the mimetic bottleneck works in, in the inverse direction of the narrative bottleneck, generating potential pasts. To choose a meme to post is to choose which game to play with the audience. More significantly, it is to choose which save file to load up. It's scenario editing of history conditioned on the current mood." End quote. And I will end there briefly to let Stephen comment, and then I'll uh, expand briefly. But that went on for a long time. I'm Come intrigued on. by the idea of memes as save files. So what you're saying is that you you have a, a nearly infinite set of memes that you can go and you can modify however you want and you can and that's kind of how you play the game. You you do your modification, you post it, everyone sees it, and that is the next step in this game. Um mm -hmm. it, it, in that case though, it's still a rather linear narrative because once you make that meme it is now part of that context forever it is now part of that corpus of memes and therefore you have progressed the game in a way that there is no going back the thing that has to be kept in mind though is that this is a you're right that it is a constraining moment in that there it's a choice at which there are a limited number of directions to go there are a limited number of possible connections. However, those connections do not move. There is no obvious next step, and any possibility can be chosen depending on what the audience chooses. So, uh, if, okay. so, so if you it, imagine the infinite canvas idea where you have a single panel with essentially, so you imagine a, a 
three by three grid where a single panel is surrounded by eight possible options that each take the say image of a cow in a field and it can go all different directions to you know the story of the ant that the cow has just stepped on to the story of the cow going about its day to the person who just chucked a rock in the air that's going to land on the cow in the future that will kill it to you know it can go in infinite possible directions where it is bottlenecked however when that image is settled upon from whence it arose is up in part to the audience due to the game that they're playing there's no necessary preceding or following image which direction it goes is entirely dependent on um the choices of the creator and the viewer i see okay so moving forward infinite freedom but the past is still frozen i think i was more con- i was more confused by like the idea of being multiple paths well the 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 past of the of of the meme is in flux especially because memes reference other memes so for example a combination of two memes does it arise from the modification of one into this one or the modification of the second into the first oh because when you make a meme that that kind of twists the meaning of a previous meme if you it, 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 that that kind of retroactively goes back and changes the original meme oh, but it makes everyone think about it differently and and also there is not necessarily a preceding meme there is only the assumption of a preceding meme oh interesting and so you're pretty much pretty much there's only the present there's only the present state and every time a game is made or a move is made the game is updated and the past is kind of washed away almost yep yep there's always interesting an infinite past to follow um and i was talking to a, a certain father-in-law of mine who we won't say his real name let's just give him a, a ridiculous nickname like no one would ever actually have i don't know like like mojo or something um and who um um <laughs> who would do that um and uh and we were talking about this and he said that uh, Scott McLeod wrote an excellent book called Understanding Comics, and one of the images in it is a picture of a guy facing a direction, and everything in the direction he's facing is colored in and appears, and behind him is just is just white. There's nothing there. And then the figure turns, and everything in front of him when he's facing the new direction is colored in, and everything behind him is blank. You know, sort of with the idea being what you perceive exists, and you really don't know if if anything else does and he tied this into some interesting theology talking about us as sort of the perception of god god perceives us therefore we exist we arise out of the divine perception the divine uh mind existing and you know you can tie that into that's uh berkeley right yep berkeley exactly and so this if you cross apply that with the idea of the infinite canvas um the the conclusion that you ultimately come to is that uh we are not mere specks of dust floating through the universe, meaningless and pointless. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, the the special, uh, cherished, uh, one could even say dank, uh, memes of God our Father. Could, could, could you say that? Could you say dank? Yes. We are, we are the, the, the cherished memes of the meme lord um, in the sky. Yes. Well said. Amen. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Yeah, I... I, I will say I, I was very appreciative of the idea of post irony. Again, I, I, I don't know why, uh, but the, uh, the the phrase of infinite canvas also made me happy for for reasons. But man, I'm just drawing a blank. I don't know. In infinite canvas just seems kind of like a joke someone would make. Like you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, some jester or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps a jester. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I am I am sure that uh, if if someone were to tear a hypothetical um, uh, you know jest of a infinite canvas in half one would wish to 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 yell about that and doing that would be called a rant mm. uh, uh, Stephen mm. well said. have you, well said. Ha- have you a, a a rant for us I I do have a rant um, and I I'm not sure if this is a, a happy rant or an angry rant or whatever but my rant is on the horror genre so last night I played for the first time uh, this game called Fear. It's a it's an oldie, but oh my goodness, is it a goodie? Uh, it is terrifying for being eleven years old. It is terrifying, exhilarating to play. The combat mechanics are on point. Controls leave a little bit to be desired, but eh. um, but the combat mechanics are on point. The the freaking terrifying nature of the whole game is just 
incredible for having you know like 11 year old graphics and whatnot and it it, 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 the, the horror genre and I have a very complicated relationship because on the one hand, I hate horror. Like I, I am such a lightweight when it comes to that. I am the first one to be screaming absolutely terrified of any sort of, you know, scary jump scene or even like heightened tension sort of thing. But man, like playing certain well-done games or watching certain well-done movies. Uh, I recently watched The Shining um, and uh, Silence of the Lambs remains one of my favorite uh, movies there is something about the idea of uh, of a genre that is in, not going to balk from, from the bad things of the universe. And in fact, will almost embrace them, but the stories that can be told through them, uh, it, it can, sh- it can showcase humanity's absolute worst, most depraved moments, but also their, their highest and greatest and most shining moments. The, the, the absolute evil being confronted with absolute courage. Um, and with, with many crappy horror movies that continually go, uh, come out that just kind of showcase gratuitous violence and depravity, man, there are some gems of the horror genre that I think can, to an extent, be legitimately edifying. Um, they can encourage one to, uh, to face down the, the awful things of the universe and that even in, uh, evil kind of goodness can triumph, uh, whether or not fear will end up that way. I, I'm a little bit suspect uh in fact i think it is a tragic ending but you know still my point stands very good rant uh yes very very true however i i would point out um briefly and before you have time to respond and i begin my own rant um that your presupposition about the nature of the horror and violence in horror movies is infinite evil being met with infinite courage but infinite courage is nothing in the face of infinite indifference uh so for my rant uh, this is a rant huh. about doing things too efficiently. Um, over the past uh, two and a half weeks or so, uh, myself and my fellow office dwellers where I work have learned that some particular objects and uh, programs, uh, uh, it, it is best to never be on top of things. Um, and when you get a request, it's best to just let things lie for like 24 hours before you actually start doing what they say they want you to do, especially if you have any doubts about it. Because and oh and is and especially if you voiced your objections based on your own assessment of said projects and then were shot down, because then they'll probably change their mind and you'll have to undo any processes that could be done automatically but can only be undone manually. And uh, this happened both to me and then to my office mate who got um, the eighty things to undo manually, but like times Ooh. four. Um, it it was very rough. Uh, the moral of the story is stop trying. Read a book instead. Mm, well said. I think that's a lesson we can all take is just stop trying. Just stop trying. Just yeah, give everyone. up. Give up. Uh, the, the indifference thing is, 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 of course, a reference to the game that we both enjoy um, and the genre, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and Call of Cthulhu. Um, mm, indeed. Yeah. What that's good is your courage mean. against uh, Cthulhu who, and who and sleeps in Ryloth? Mm, <laughs> indeed. Nothing. Nothing is... Uh... Yeah, that 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 is kind of the ultimate Lovecraftian say, is statement is just indifference. Like your courage, it doesn't matter. Cool. And uh, wow, I, I'm actually impressed. We we didn't even need Sam here to end on a depressing note. Absolutely, man. Uh, and and it's speaking of it, yeah, it's true. It's true. I am not sure how I. I'll have to mull this over. Um, um, um. But but speaking of that note, uh, on that note, uh. For everyone here at the uh, Problem with Reading Podcast, uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And we will see you next time. Dan Foster Wall, it's there. I said it. I couldn't stop it. I'm sorry. <laughs> DFW.